रखते हैं My name is Priya and I'm a postdoc at McMaster University and these are our summer students at the Center for Emerging Device Technology. Excuse me. Okay. I'm going to be uh, talking to them a little bit about plasmonics. Uh, the first question I had for you is, do you know why there's a stained glass picture on the first slide? No. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, you will know by the time I get through. So um, plasmonics is a particular branch of nanophotonics um, and uh, with nanophotonics uh, basically what we're trying to do is miniaturize macro scale optics which are traditionally in the millimeter uh, length scale down to the nanometer um, uh, scale. And the reason to do this is because we want to um, achieve more efficient light emission at the nanoscale for example for optics on a chip application. Um, we also want to have more effective ways to convert light to electrical energy, uh, for example, for solar cell applications. Um, and uh, in order to do both the uh, uh, one and two, we need to be able to uh, manipulate light in a determined way uh, at the nanoscale. And one of the ways to do that is with plasmonic materials. So what is a plasmon? So a plasmon basically is a charge density wave um, which is a collective oscillation of electrons and um, it's generally observed in metals which are uh, like Druda metals which have a free sea of electrons um, and this collective oscillation gives rise to an optical resonance and the optical resonance is both dependent on what the shape of the nanoparticle is um, as well as on what material it is made of. For example, um, if it's made of gold or silver or copper, um, the plasma resonance is at a different wavelength. Um, so by having a core shell geometry, you can achieve tunability of the plasmon and put the resonance in a, a predetermined place in the near infrared. And this can be um, of use for many applications, especially um, in the biomedical field. So um, now we come back to the beginning where I asked you, uh, do you know why I have a ruby glass? Well, come to, um, actually ruby glass is one of the earliest applications of nanotechnology because what gives ruby glass its characteristic red color is the presence of gold nanoparticles within the matrix of glass. So um, for, for, for this type of colloid ill gold, which has a, a, a particle radius from 26 uh, to 100 angstroms, which is uh, 2.6 to 10 nanometers, um, they, they have an optical resonance at 520 nanometers. And uh, if you embed this in glass, then it gives rise to the ruby red color in transmission. Well, what I have here um, are gold colloid also, but these are um, these are, 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 are bigger, they're about 250 nanometers, and um, these can be used especially uh, in order to generate contrast in biological microscope images, they can be used to help enhance uh, fluorescence, because what happens is when you have a plasmon resonance, you have a strong electromagnetic field which is bound to the surface of the nanoparticle, and you can use that to sense changes, very small changes happening at that interface. For example, antibody binding events can be sensed. Or you can use that strong electric field to enhance fluorescence, say of a fluorophore play, placed at a, um, at, a, at a defined distance, not too close, not too far, and you get an enhancement of the fluorescence. So that's gold nanoparticles, a brief introduction. Do um, you have any questions? I have a question. What kind of um, different metals are you limited to for this resonance? Is it just the three you mentioned or is there more? Well, basically, um, metals don't always behave in the idealized picture that we have, the solid state picture of a free electron gas. So any metal which behaves like um, the, the, the idealized version, which tend to be noble metals, um, aluminum too, but with aluminum you have the practical problem that it has an oxide. Um, you, you should be able to see, um, you know, uh, this effect. But if you have like something that's very reactive and that doesn't really behave like your classical idealized metal, uh, for example, potassium or something, perhaps, um, then then um, anything that whose behavior is not determined by the idealized uh, me metal picture, 
uh, wouldn't have a plasma resonance. But you can also see it in um, semiconductors in like two-dimensional gas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank so. you. Any? Um, so you said that uh, there's a strong electric field at the surface of these particles, and that can be used to identify small changes. How do they do? Th how do they identify those small changes? Well, it's it's got to do with the, the variation, the dielectric constant that, that that happens because of that. So 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 the the field is very sensitive to the the uh, the dielectric constant um, in the immediate vicinity of um, where the binding happens. And so, like if you have an antibody, um, then you fractionally change the dielectric constant, and that's how you you sense it. So you you see a shift. Um, you see a shift in where your optical resonance peak is. So, you, so what what you would do is you would keep monitoring how this particular structure interacts with light, and then once you have the binding event, you would see a shift in the resonance peak, and that's how you know that um, mm. this event has occurred. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.